Welcome, welcome everyone to our June webinar series. We're gonna wait a few minutes to get started and give everyone a chance to log on today. Give it a couple more seconds. Okay, looks like we got a, a lot of people logging on today. That's fantastic. All right, so we can get started. Um, so welcome to the June uh, webinar series. Today, our conversation will be with two of our recently awarded Benson Fellows, Dr. Ruth Heizenga and Dr. Elba Pasquale Goni. So welcome, ladies, to the webinar. Yeah, Thank well, you. really great. Thank you for the invitation. It's great ah, to join. Amazing. We're, we're so excited to have you. Um, there is another Benson Fellow from 2019 that was unfortunately unable to make it today, but her name is Dr. Genev Femi. Um, and her work is in this, uh, studying patients with antibodies that target uh, specific parts of the peripheral nerve. And we're going to include some of her work in the summary that everyone will receive after the webinar. So um, again, these are our two uh, recent Benson Fellows. And in case you are not familiar with the Benson Fellowship Award, it is up to 150,000 per year for three years to fund peripheral inflammatory neuropathy research. The grant was established in honor of Robert Benson, a survivor of Guillain-Barre syndrome, and his wonderful wife, Estelle Benson, who many of you know. Uh, Estelle is our founder and our wonderful leader. Um, so today we will speak with our guests about their work and their views on how research is advancing. Uh, these webinars are meant to be educational, so if you could just keep your questions to uh, research-related questions and not necessarily to your medical condition, um, if you have issues and um, concerns with your medical condition, we encourage you to reach out to your doctor or have your doctor contact us for our doctor to doctor consult and we can get um, your doctor in touch with one of our global medical advisors. Um, and a special reminder, we are expecting a lot of questions. So we were going to try to get to as many as possible. Um, if you do have a question, just put it in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, any questions that we don't get to, there will be a follow-up summary, and we'll try to reach out to our experts and get your questions answered and put them in the summary as well. So without further ado, um, let's get started. And I'm going to have both of you introduce yourselves and give a brief overview of your research and when you received the Benson Fellowship Award and just about your, your recent studies for that. So Dr. Pasquale, why don't we start with you? Okay, thank you. Yeah, so much for the opportunity to be here today. Sure. So I am a clinical neurologist. I mm -hmm. work in the neuromuscular diseases unit in the hospital of uh, San Pau in Barcelona in Spain. And, and here I carry out patient care and also research tasks in the field of inflammatory neuropathies. Mm -hmm. In 2021, I finished my PhD on autoantibodies in CIDP that I did at Dr. Carol's lab. And in 2022, I was awarded with the Benson Fellowship Grant that it was a really a big opportunity to continue my career as a scientist specializing in this field of autoimmune neuropathies. And this Benson Fellowship research project has a length of three years. So now I am in the third year of the project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The title of my project is Biomarkers in the Diagnosis and Follow-up of uh, CADP. Mm -hmm. And this is a postdoctoral research project that is quite ambitious and it includes uh, three parts. Mm -hmm. So the first one is about the research of new autoantibodies in patients with uh, CADP. Mm -hmm. The second part is uh, to validate uh, new biomarkers in CADP. Specifically, we are investigating the role of uh, serum or filament levels in patients with CIDP and other chronic autoimmune neuropathies. Mm. And the third part of this project aims to validate a new wearable biomechanical technology to monitor gait and clinical status in patients uh, with CIDP. And I, I think that's a little bit about the uh, yeah. my research project. Oh, that's amazing. Um, so the, for the non-scientists, I'm going to circle back to you and have you clarify some of that terminology, okay? But first, uh, I'm going to move over to, to Ruth. Um, so welcome, Ruth. Nice to see you again. Um, so again, if you could introduce yourself and tell us a little sure. bit about your study, that'd be great. 
Yeah, so my name is Ruth Huizinga, um, and I'm a biomedical scientist, so I'm not a medical doctor. Mm. Um, and uh, currently I'm appointed as assist assistant professor and group leader at the Department of Immunology in um, uh, the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam uh, mm. in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I actually was the first uh, Benson Fellow, uh, which mm -hmm. uh, was awarded in 2014. So of mm -hmm. course that was a real honor. Yeah. Um, it's already yeah almost 10 years ago, so it's quite uh, some time ago. Um, and actually with uh, my project, um, I wanted to understand how the immune system um, uh, of persons with GBS uh, responds to microbes. Mm. Um, so basically to understand why only some per persons with those infections uh, develop uh, GBS. Um, and um, uh, so during the project, I, I focused on really the immediate immune response to viruses. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, well, I did not really see a difference between persons with GBS and controls. Mm. Um, so in that sense, I think the immune system of persons with GBS uh, seems to work normally, mm. um, at least for the parameters that I investigated, because of course the immune system is quite complex. Right. Um, and um, uh, one thing that we also observed was uh, a correlation between, let's say, activations or activated immune cells in the blood of patients with GBS um, and uh, disease severity. Um, so maybe this could mean that, let's say an ongoing immune activation or the extent of immune activation, uh, this might be important during the uh, disease course. Amazing. Two brilliant ladies with us here today. Um, so uh, Dr. Goni, could you please explain just very simply what is a biomarker and why would it be important to the GBS CIDP community? Okay, yeah. so I look for the definition of biomarker and the general definition, this says that a biomarker can, is a molecule or a gene or a, a characteristic by which a particular pathological or physiological process or disease can be identified. So I, I would say that there can be uh, very different types of biomarkers. For example, mm -hmm. antibodies can be biomarkers and they have shown how important they are uh, in autoimmune neuropathies because they can be useful in the diagnosis of some subtypes of patients and also for the monitoring of the disease. And also, as I previously mentioned, also, um, we have now a new biomarker in neurology that mm -hmm. is being investigated in different, different neurological disorders. This biomarker is called the serum uh, neurofilament light. That is a protein from the skeleton of the neurons that is released to blood when there is a, a damage of the uh, axon of the neurons. So we can test this biomarker in blood using mm -hmm. novel techniques. And this means that with a simple blood test, we can see how the axons of the neurons are doing. So this seems that it can be very helpful in different uh, neurological diseases. And the diagnosis, and mostly for diagnosis purposes, sounds like well, actually, in the case of uh, these neurofilaments, maybe mm. they are more useful for the monitoring of the mm. disease. Okay. I see the progression or the response to different therapies, mm -hmm. uh, while an antibodies can be more useful in the diagnostic part of the disease. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, um, so Ruth, uh, for antibodies, can you explain a little bit just what that terminology means? Um, and what they do for the body. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, well, actually antibodies are really fascinating um, molecules mm. um, and they play an important role um, both during health, uh, but also during uh, disease. Okay. Um, and that's also why uh, antibodies are a subject of many research projects, including um, ALBA's research project and, and GenF's and, and also uh, part of the projects that we do here in Rotterdam. Um, so to actually explain um, what they do for the body, yeah. um, I want to show you something. Oh, great. Okay, so I actually made an antibody. So this is mm. the structure of an antibody. 
Um, and you can see these are, let's say, let's, okay, turn it to the back. So it's, it's a Y-shaped molecule and you can see that the antibodies has two arms. Um, and with the end of each arm, the antibody can actually attach to, let's say, a microbe or a molecule. So um, suppose this is a, a bacterium or, or a virus. Um, the antibody can actually bind very well to this, to this microbe. Um, and by that, it can also uh, inactivate or neutralize the, uh, the pathogen. Um, mm -hmm. And this is the reason why they play a really important role during infections, for example. Um, now, you have many different antibodies, so, uh, and they all differ a little bit. So this is another one um, in, in, in blue, also Y-shaped. But you can see that the ends are slightly different than, than the other ones. Mm -hmm. um, and in the end, um, each person can have all, more than a trillion of those antibodies um, in their body. So that means that, yeah, you can also be protected to a wide range of uh, microbes. Um, however, sometimes this can go wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is also the case what's happening in GBS and uh, in some CIDP patients and definitely also in patients with autoimmune nodopathy. Um, and this is when the antibodies then target some of the molecules that are present in your own nerves. Mm. So then your immune response is, you know, going against you. Um, and this is what we think that's also one of the problems in GBS and um, CRDP. So, so very important um, area to target in on then, right? As you're, as you're trying to um, figure out where, why people yeah. usually get these conditions. Yeah, um, actually. Yeah, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so we are talking about basic research today. Um, but can you actually explain the difference between basic research and clinical research? Um, so I'll I'll kick that over to Elba and get started with that. Okay. So I will explain what uh, clinical research is, and then I think Ruth can explain it. Okay. A bit Perfect. Yeah. Great. That's great. Is, yeah. It's more basic, and I am more clinical. Mm -hmm. So the clinical research, um, it happens uh, with uh, the patients, or we also do research with uh, data from these patients or with the uh, samples from these patients that can be the blood, the CSF, or other tissues. And we, would we, do, we use these uh, samples to try to understand the health and the disease. And um, this clinical research uh, also, there can be different types. Like for example, we have the clinical trials that are very important to test uh, new therapies, mm -hmm. but also natural history uh, studies are very important to understand the, the history of the different, the different diseases. And to do that, for example, in the case of uh, GBS and CADP, we have the IGOS. Now we have the ink base that is collecting a lot of uh, clinical data and also biological samples from patients. And with all uh, this, we, we try to understand better the disease and to find new therapies. So very briefly, Elba, could you explain what IGOS and InkBase are, what kind of studies they are? I'm not sure the audience um, is familiar with all of that. Okay. Yeah. So uh, regarding the IGOS, uh, this is an uh, international study that is uh, started, I don't know exactly um, when, but some years ago, mm -hmm. and it has collected uh, data from uh, thousands of patients with uh, GBS, uh, clinical data, and also a lot of uh, samples, electrophysiological data. And now we are having a lot of results from this, uh, from all this data, informing about uh, different uh, different things about uh, GBS. Mm -hmm. Also, I think that Ruth is uh, very important. Wow. Great. And she can give us uh, some other information. And the InkBase uh, is a database that um, just started collecting data uh, from patients with uh, CIDP. This is an international database that is now uh, recruiting patients. So when mm -hmm. patients uh, who want to participate, I guess that they can contact with their with their doctors and ask if they, because I know there are um, centers part participating all over the world, so maybe they can they can join and also um, in basis collecting uh, samples to uh, future studies. Great, great. And, and Ruth, back to you for the basic 
uh, research explanation. And if you have yeah. anything to add for IGOs and Ingbase, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, basic research, it's sometimes also called fundamental research. Mm. Um, and this is basically a type of research um, with the goal to understand, let's say, natural processes. Um, so really from biology to chemistry to physics. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for, let's say, biomedical scientists, um, well, like us, um, I think it means that we want to understand how the body works. Mm -hmm. um, let's say how molecules work, um, how cells communicate with each other, um, uh, the different processes that occur during, um, yeah, during health. Mm. Um, and um, it's not really aimed already at, let's say, application. So not really aimed at finding a therapy or making, let's say, a new technique or so. But it's just really based, okay, because we're curious and we want to understand, let's say, what's happening in uh, in the body and the interaction with the, uh, let's say, the environment. Mm. So that brings me to my next question is, um, what inspired you, we'll stay with you, Ruth, what inspired you to actually pursue this particular question you're trying to answer with your study? Was it a mentor, a person? Was it just your love of science? What inspired you? Oof. Um, yeah, that's a difficult question. Mm. Um, but actually, I'm, uh, I'm a really curious person. So mm -hmm. I really want to understand how things work. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, just before the Benson Fellowship, uh, before I wrote it, uh, we did a study in which we investigated immune responses to Campylobacter. Mm. Um, and there we found, let's say, this increased immune responses in patients with DBS. And I think that sort of made us wonder, um, yeah, whether this was, let's say, a, a general mechanism. So whether it could also apply for other pathogens like viruses or yeah. whether it was more specific to, uh, to Campylobacter. Mm. Um, so, um, and of course, you know, you talk to people, your mentor and your supervisors, etc. Um, so, you know, along the way, things will shape more into a proposal. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, I, th I think, yeah, I think it's more the curiosity that yeah. drives me. Yeah. Passion. That's awesome. Um, how about you, Elba? What, what drove you to want to answer these questions specifically? Yeah. I, I agree with Ruth. I am also mm -hmm. very curious. Mm -hmm. I feel this is something common in researchers. I, yeah. I think. Uh, yeah. So in the case of my research project, also uh, I got the inspiration in the clinic when I see patients with CIDP and also with my mentor, Dr. Luis Querol, we are aware that uh, patients diagnosed with CIDP are very heterogeneous. They have different clinical uh, different symptoms, different evolution, different response to therapies. So uh, we believe that um, in the CIDP syndrome, and there are different uh, subsets of patients that can be better classified, and also not all, not only to classify the better, but also to understand the mechanisms that are causing mm -hmm. the the disease that at the moment are not very well understood. Yeah. So also uh, the other problem that we have in the clinical practice is that at the moment, uh, the monitoring of patients to see the progression, the evolution, the response to therapies is not very objective at the moment mm -hmm. because we don't have what we said. We don't have a biomarker that talks about how is the myelin and how are the axons. And also we use clinical scales, uh, the neurological examination and the patient reported outcomes, but we know that they can be a little bit subjective sometimes. Mm -hmm. So we believe that we need more objective uh, outcomes. So for this, for all these reasons, uh, we think that uh, investigating the biomarkers and also using new wearable uh, technologies may help to better monitor uh, patients in the in the clinical routine. That's great. That's great. So, so you mentioned the monitoring of patients and better outcomes. Ruth, any um, unmet, unmet needs that you would like to um, just discuss and, and bring to our audience that you see in this community? Mm, well, what's what what makes me also 
really curious is indeed also the, the diversity between patients, as mm. Alba also mentions. Um, and of course, this is this is absolutely true for, for CIDP, but I think also for GBS, mm. um, where also uh, yeah, some patients recover really fast and others take much longer to recover. Yeah. Um, and also, um, let's say, if you think about more about the mechanisms of disease, we sort of think that certain patients have more damage of the myelin, so the, the wrapping around the, let's say, the nerve mm. fibers, whereas in others, there is really more neuronal damage or axonal damage. Yeah. Um, um, and, and these different processes, I think, are not really well understood. I mean, we know that antibodies yeah. can occur in both types of uh, subtypes of this disease, but we don't really understand um, why this, this is the case. Mm. Um, and um, yeah, we, we have a really nice finding, let's say the last couple of years where we mm. actually succeeded in um, isolating an antibody from a patient with GBS. Mm. Um, of course, we were able to detect all these antibodies, but we didn't really know, let's say, the structure mm. of the antibody. Um, but now we have it at least from one antibody from one patient. Um, okay. And with this, um, we can hopefully understand, okay, what, what's really binding? Uh, uh, what's What does the antibody bind? And why mm. in that person... Uh, this would cause, let's say, the uh, the damage to the myelin. So mm. I think it was kind of a eureka moment uh, in yeah. the lab when we when we really succeeded. Amazing. Uh, but Amazing. this is something I think we need to elaborate and we mm. need to expand as a as a community and see, yeah. you know, really what's going on there. Absolutely. So let me ask you this: um, you have both kind of touched on this, but how does your research specifically affect people's lives? Like, if somebody said, if this research um, is successful, your life will change in this way, or, or the patient's lives, I should say. So, um, so Alba, how would your research um, affect a patient's life? You've, okay. you've touched on it, but but just to just to give a different angle on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, I think that if we succeed with our research and we have some positive positive results, for example, if we talk about the serum filament that we can monitor in the blood of the patients. Uh, if we see that this is useful, uh, this will help to uh, treat better our patients because we might be able to see when they are active, when they need to uh, change their therapy because the therapy is not being enough or in, in the opposite, maybe at some point they don't need to be under therapy because they are inactive. So mm -hmm. if we are able to uh, see how they are doing, how they are, uh, their neurons, their, their nerves, and the uh, myelin doing, maybe we can uh, improve the, 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 the therapy strategy in these patients. Also uh, regarding the antibodies, I think that if we are able to uh, discover new antibodies as for mm -hmm. example what happened uh, in the past with um, uh, some antibodies that were discovered we will be able to understand better the mechanisms that are causing the disease and um, this may help to better choose the therapy that is going to be effective for these patients mm -hmm. uh, so there can be uh, impact. yeah Levels. A lot of advancements from that. And how about you, Ruth? Um, how how can you just draw that, illustrate that picture for us? Yeah, well, I totally agree with with Elba on this. Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, do, doing really basic research, I think it's it's it takes um, it's it's yeah difficult to say you know exactly. Then you know you will improve yeah. a person's life. Mm -hmm. um, but I think and I hope in the long run that by by getting more knowledge about the mechanisms that really underlie the disease, yeah. um, that, um, yeah, that, that this can help to uh, indeed to to get more biomarkers, to to improve the diagnosis and also to offer more, yeah, more strategies for for patients to be treated. I think yeah. we've seen some examples also in the past of, of basic research. Um, now with the complement, for example, uh, and and new trials. So um, mm -hmm. uh, 
so in the end, I think you know this is the way uh, we should we should go. Yeah, yeah. So what um, what would be the next step for you in your research? You you seem very inspired to continue with it. What would be the next step? For me, you mean? Yes. Um, yeah, I'm still in research indeed. Um, mm -hmm. uh, still not bored. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, well, you know, I, I'm really excited about, you know, this finding of this antibody from the patient. So and yeah. I think um, if we can expand on that and uh, isolate more antibodies from, let's say, patients with more axonal subtypes, uh, maybe also um, uh, antibodies from patients with autoimmune nodopathy, so because mm -hmm. they have a different mechanism mm -hmm. of, of disease, um, then I think that would be really important to compare. Um, and at the moment, we are investigating all this, let's say, in a culture dish, mm. um, which is, well, relatively easy. Yeah. Uh, but of course, you know, studying this in, let's say, an actual nerve environment mm. or in an actual, yeah, peripheral nerve, that's, yeah. of course, much more challenging. So. Yeah. That will take some more efforts to really um, to understand what's going on there. Yeah, yeah. And Elba, how about you? What is, what is the next step in research for you, um, or in this type of research? Okay. So um, if we find that uh, what we are investigating is useful, the next uh, step would be to implement this in the clinical practice. So because now we are, mm. for example, we are testing the. Uh, these biomarkers only in patients uh, who that enrolled uh, the study, but if mm -hmm. we see that this is um, useful, it would be uh, important to implement all this um, routine in, in the clinical practice, but also there are some um, other biomarkers that would need uh, further research because, mm -hmm. as we said, uh, filament levels are informing about the axons, but as you know, in CIDP, uh, the problem is initially at the myelin, so we still need to find a biomarker informing about the myelin status, because we know that in some patients with CIDP, the filament levels can be in normal range, but mm. still there is uh, inflammation uh, that we, that is um, at the myelin. So we need a myelin biomarker. So this this needs some further research. Right, Chris. It sounds like you guys have a long term plan, which is yeah, amazing that. for this community. Um, so we've got some interesting questions coming in from the live audience. So I'm going to throw some questions at you guys. Uh, one, uh, the first one is, do uh, either of you use AI in your work, in your research work, artificial intelligence? Oh, and you can talk about at least. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's of course really a challenge uh, nowadays yeah. um, mm -hmm. uh, to use AI. Um, I would say not personally, not not yet. No, mm -hmm. but I think I, I think it's of course one of the most recent developments that holds a lot of promise. Yeah. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, we should all invest in that and um, and and use this. About that. Um, I have to say, I'm not sure whether I'm really capable of learning that, but I think, you know, well, collaborating with people who are yeah. you know, smart, um, young, um, and still can, you know, do all those tricks, um, I think that would be really helpful. Yeah. Yeah, not sure about you, Alba, you're a bit, a bit <laughs> just for me. Uh, <laughs> so... We are using AI, I am not. So we are mm -hmm. collaborating with engineers mm -hmm. uh, doing the study of the wearable biomechanical technology because mm -hmm. we are like collecting a lot of data from different sensors mm -hmm. that patients wear uh, in the legs and also in their shoes. So yeah. we get like a lot of data from the yeah. angles and the vertical force of the feet and all this data needs to be processed with AI. Yeah. We have a team of engineers that are analyzing all this data. So yeah, yeah. I think that AI is the future. It and is the future. We all need to learn a little bit how to manage with it. It's a whole new world, but um, I think it's, it's a very, big asset probably when it comes to research, right? Or could be. Um, yeah. So Elba, a question came in for you. And the question is, is there a positive correlation between serum neurofilament protein levels and disease 
severity. Clearly, this came in from a doctor or a scientist. So maybe you can explain uh, what serum neurofilament protein levels are, and then if you could answer yeah. the question, that would be great. So, yeah, so as we said, these uh, serum neurofilament levels are talking about the axonal damage of the mm -hmm. peripheral nerves. So we know that in certain diseases such as uh, GBS, we find very elevated levels of, the, of these biomarkers mm -hmm. in the acute phase of the disease. And while uh, the weeks and the months uh, go and the patient is recovers, these levels go down and they normalize. Mm -hmm. okay? So this is very clear in GBS that is like a very acute disease. Uh, we also know that in some uh, chronic uh, neuropathies like uh, autoimmune neuropathies, also this happens, like for example, in patients with uh, antineurofasting 155 antibodies, they mm. also, during the acute phase of the disease, they have elevated levels and these levels correlate with, uh, with disease severity. Uh, but uh, what we don't know yet is if this also happens in CIDP. So that's why mm. we're uh, studying this. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so for both of you, is there any research to gain a better understanding of why IVIG is actually an effective treatment? Um, because we, we've definitely heard that it, it works and we're not 100% sure why it works. Is there any research being done to, to understand that better? So Ruth, I'll kick it to you first. Yeah, well, I think we have to talk for another hour if we yeah. want to. Uh, <laughs> that's another webinar. That's, yeah, that's a follow-up webinar. Indeed, yeah, indeed, IVIG is effective. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that there are various mechanisms that are important. Mm. So um, for one, I'll, I'll just get the antibody again. So yeah, one, please. Um, so great. this is yeah. again the Y-shaped molecule. And then this is the part that is constant in, let's say, all antibodies. Mm -hmm. um, and this is also causing the, let's say, the detrimental effect. So mm -hmm. it's it's like a flag. Okay. Um, and using, let's say, lots of uh, normal intravenous immuno immunoglobulins, so antibodies, uh, you will be able to, let's say, to compete with the pathogenic ones. Um, and the idea is that um, the, uh, the, the, let's say, the effects or the effector mechanism of the antibodies get blocked and that the antibodies are reduced much faster than they normally would do. Um, but but there, is, there are also many other um, regulation, uh, modes of regulation that also occur. And it's it's really difficult to pinpoint, let's say this is mm. the most important uh, mm. um, one. Yeah, maybe Alba is a clinician. Yeah. What do you always say to your patients about yeah. IVIG? Yeah. It's a very difficult answer because mm. I agree with you, Ruth, that maybe there are different mechanisms and maybe in different patients, uh, different mechanisms are acting. And so I think we don't know the whole thing about why yeah. IVIG are effective in these disorders. But, but there is research being done to try to find that out, sounds like, or at least being talked about. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Yeah, we, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was just wanting to say we we did do a study in CIDP looking at mm. let's say more genetic variants mm. um, to understand why certain people um, uh, do not respond to mm. to IVIG, mm -hmm. um, and and there are some genetic differences between patients that that might help to explain um, this responsiveness. Um, um, so yeah, um, it, it's it's too far yet to let's say really use already in the clinic to actually mm. say, okay well probably you won't um, benefit from IVIG but yeah. well I hope in the future that we would understand more about yeah. these specifics and that we can sort of also tailor the therapies to, mm. to for patients. Is there anything published, Ruth, about that particular study that patients could read about, or not yet? Um, yeah, this is a study published by um, uh, Krista Koutwaard as first okay. author Okay. Um, uh, some years ago. Um, uh, and I think, well, at least the summary should be findable on, on online. The, uh, okay, yeah. great. We'll try and find that and put it in our follow-up webinar summary. Great. Um, 
Okay, next question. We're getting a lot of questions coming in, ladies. Uh, will any of this research have the potential of neurorestorative outcomes that repair the myelin around the peripheral nerves? Anyone want to take that first? Can we yeah. read it again? Mm -hmm. Any of them? Uh, yeah. I know there are no myelin restorative rest therapies that are effective at the moment. Mm -hmm. Neuropathies and also I think there there were some studies for in in multiple sclerosis that also is a neurological disease but of the central nervous system and in this disease there were some clinical trials uh, investigating this but the drugs uh, were not uh, the the results were not positive so at the moment we don't have myelin restorative therapies okay. yeah okay. Well, in the, in the end, you know, that's also amazing of the human body, of course, that some mm -hmm. parts of the human body can uh, regenerate. Yeah. Um, and, and luckily in the PNS and, or in the peripheral nervous system, this, this is much more easy than in the central nervous system, like your mm -hmm. brain and, and spinal cord. Yeah. Um, but of course, since nerves also are quite long, so they, they can span yeah, all the way to your finger, this, this also takes a long time. Um, and of, uh, I agree with, you know, the person who asked the question that, of course, it would be great if we could accelerate this regeneration. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, for, for this also more research is needed to actually understand this process of, of myelin regeneration. Mm. Um, and I think most important is actually to prevent the axon from being degenerating. So in that respect, the neurofilament biomarker that Alba is referring to, I think it's yeah, really important to um, uh, yeah to to measure and to 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 monitor this because you want to prevent, let's say, the long term um, deficits um, uh, caused by this axonal degeneration. So it sounds like out of some of these questions, I can see your your heads are spinning with new research projects coming down the line. <laughs> of course, <laughs> but this is yeah. So this is so conversations. I'm assuming with patients is how you actually do get ideas for research, right? And working with patients. So what? Um, how can patients play a role in research? How can they get involved? In your opinions? Well, you know, I think. Um... For both of us, well, speaking also for Alba, I think, you know, we, we need also study materials and data. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, yeah, it's really important that if patients can and, um, yeah, have the, the possibility to participate in in studies and, and trials, then, um, yeah, th this is really important because without samples or data, yeah, it's it's really difficult to mm. get uh, to get further. Um yeah, what else? Any other ways, Elba, that patients can get involved that you know of? Other than- I totally agree with Ruth. Yeah. It is very important to participate in the- Clinical trials. Studies, in the observation studies, and mm -hmm. also in the clinical trials so that yeah. we can have new therapies. Uh, but in my experience, at least, for example, here in the research that we are doing with the Venture Fellowship, all the patients are so available here to participate. So I am so happy and so welcome. That's great. That. That's great. Uh, is there, um, how do they actually find out about clinical trials? If somebody was interested, where would you send them? Yeah, yeah I think, I think it's maybe um, by talking to your doctor, I think mm -hmm. you get an idea of what's, um, um, what's 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 yeah currently going on in uh, let's say your hospital, um, and I think yeah, saying this I think it is also important that people try to go to excellence centers at least you know yeah. some centers that are recommended by the foundation for example yeah. mm -hmm. uh, because the foundation recognizes okay there are you know uh, good physicians. Um, if people are doing research in these uh, medical centers, um, you know, you also have the opportunity to participate in, in possibly any new trials that, that go on. Um, so I think, yeah, if you can, and if you have a choice, of course, then that might be really important. Yeah. 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 We, we, yeah. Have the, um, go ahead. 
Yeah, no, I was just thinking about the participation that you asked uh, the previous question. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I know you organize these patient conferences yes. um, every year or every two years or every so. Every two years, yep. Mm -hmm. um, and that, of course, many uh, medical doctors, um, uh, yeah, they, they provide updates also on what they're doing and, and let's say the new... Uh, the new findings that they did and i think also you know participating in those conferences and, and really talking to scientists and doctors i think it also helps to you know to get involved and to um it also helps as a scientist you know to get motivated and to yeah you know to continue with uh, with your work and um yeah to uh, um to be part uh, yeah, of the community focused on new ideas and, yeah and, yeah that's yeah. That's that's an excellent point. Um, so we we do have a biennial conference, an international conference. We have regional conferences. Um, we have patient panels. Um, we have lots of ways for patients to get involved in research and learn about the clinical trials um, on our website as well. So just a note on that. Um, lots more questions here. Okay. So can a biomarker help shorten the long diagnosis journey for CIDP? I think we probably know the question to that, but Elba. Oh, sorry, can, you, can, you oh, can, a, can a biomarker help shorten the long diagnosis journey for CIDP? Well, uh, as we said, as we have different types of biomarkers, mm -hmm. uh, some of them they do. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that the main biomarker that we have now, as we said, are antibodies. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are helpful in some subsets of patients. In typical CIDP patients, we don't have uh, an antibody yet, right. so that's why we are still investigating this. Right. But sometimes patients can be initially diagnosed of CIDP, but if we test some other antibodies, we can find that maybe this patient that was diagnosed with CIDP, uh, in fact, it has a different disease like an autoimmune neuropathy. So in this case, it would be important to think of this uh, alternative diagnosis and to test um, these antibodies, these biomarkers in, in the blood of uh, these patients. Okay. Um, what is the reason for nerve damage being so asymmetrical, especially in CIDP or MMN? So it's our first MMN question. Reason for nerve damage being so asymmetrical in those conditions. Yeah. So uh, these kind of disorders, uh, as you know, they are autoimmune. And we know that the, the inflammation that happens in the, in the nerves it can be very patchy, so it can affect only like one limb or one limb from like one upper limb and the other side in the lower limb. And this, um, this I think it is just aleatory in in some types of CIDP that are uh, asymmetric, like um, the Lewis Sumner um, variants, and also of course in MMN in mm. this this happens because the information is a little bit aleatory, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so can I ask you both, where can we find more about your research? Um, there's been publications, right, based on the Benson Fell study that you've been doing? Yeah, so indeed, um, of course, um, um, yeah, scientific articles are mm -hmm. published um, uh, in, in uh, scientific journals. Okay. Um, some of them are also available online, also for mm -hmm. free. I mean, I think it's it's becoming now more common practice that everybody can actually access yeah. um, those uh, those articles. Um, and um, I think we were talking about IGOS, um, mm -hmm. the International GPS Outcome Study. Uh, we actually have a new website. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so this might also be interesting indeed for uh, for the participants here to to check it out. Um, and the website is www.igosresearch.com. Um, and also there you can find uh, some more explanations also about the, the, yeah, the studies that we did and set up of the study, um, who's involved, etc. So I think, yeah, this might be interesting for, for, for participants to, uh, to check out. That's great. That's great. Thanks, Ruth. And uh, we'll be sure to put that in the summary too, the link for everyone. So don't have to worry right. about it. 
taking too many notes. Um, and so Elba, how about you? How, where can we find more about your research? Yeah, so as, as Ruth said, uh, we publish uh, mm -hmm. in scientific journals. Uh, but uh, in the case of uh, the research of the Benson Fellow, we still don't have any publication for now, but uh, now we will be presenting some of the results in the meeting of the Peripheral Nerve Society that is happening in the coming days. Mm -hmm. This is a meeting like for more for professional meeting, but also uh, I think that a very good idea for patients is to attend to this uh, conference uh, that are made for, uh, by the foundation for patients where we can share all the research results and I will be happy to um, share all the final results when we have them. Yeah, yeah, that, that really is the best way to learn about research is try to make it to one of our events um, because you have the researchers right there uh, live and willing to answer questions and present and really explain their research. Um, we also have a research portal on our website. Um, so I did mention you could find out about trials, um, but there's a research portal and we try to collect all the uh, latest research in our space and certainly from our fellows and have it posted there as well. Um, so I think that it may be it with our questions. Do you guys have any final thoughts, any final words, anything for the community that, that we didn't get to today that you'd like to share? Um, well, you know, maybe, maybe people wonder like, okay, so what is the overall status of the research? Mm. Mm -hmm. right so very good very um, good point yeah because i mean yeah research it's uh it's taking a long time it's it's a lot of work you know to get from the idea to collect data to do the measurements to analyze and reanalyze etc mm. um so you know um yeah what's what's the current status now and um uh, I, I think the the status of the research, at least in GBS and CIDP, is actually quite quite good, um, especially given that uh, the diseases are quite rare. Mm. Um, uh, because of course, for let's say cancer related research, there is a lot of more money available, mm. um, uh, and there I think the developments uh, go yeah go faster because uh, yeah I think for many of the research groups at the moment. I think money is really the, the limiting factor in order mm. to do uh, the research. So, you know, you need personnel, you need materials, equipment, etc. Uh, but nevertheless, I think within the community, um, we are uh, doing quite well. And I think it's also really nice to see that the international collaboration is, is paying off. Um, so, yeah, we already talked about IGOS, about Inkbase. Um, so for, for IGOS, for example, we are now doing a large genetic study mm. um, to investigate which genetic variants are associated with GBS. Um, so, so this is something, yeah, really exciting, really new, of course. Yeah. Um, and, um, uh, and Elba already mentioned also these new antibodies that were discovered um, in patients that were initially diagnosed with CIDP, but then because of these antibodies, yeah, we yeah the, the the scientists realized that it's actually a different condition. Um, so mm -hmm. and this is something from the last ten years, um, and I would see this as a really big uh, breakthrough. Yeah. Um, with um, yeah, lots of uh, uh, implications for the patient uh, itself. Um, um, and I think also regarding drugs, um, I think there is an exciting time. Um, uh, ahead of us, May maybe yeah. Elba can talk more about, let's say, the novel uh, that drugs, would be great. novel trials that are yeah. going on. That would be great, Elba. Yeah, so actually, yeah, we are happy. Uh, also, I think patients that are aware also, because it seems that in the future or in the coming months and years, we are going to have different uh, results from from clinical trials uh, that are now ongoing. And uh, actually we will have uh, some of the very first uh, results announced in the conference that we are attending in the coming days. But uh, I think that we are gonna have some very positive uh, news. And positive Amazing. Results. And this is always a good thing 
especially okay. in these rare diseases mm -hmm. that are a little bit orphan of uh, therapy. So yeah. we we are excited about the coming years because we think that it's going to change a little bit the therapeutic uh, panorama that we have in these uh, disorders. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, we're going to have to check in with you two every couple of months, it sounds like. There's so much activity and excitement going on in this field. Um, so I wanted to read from Geneve Femi, the other Benson Fellow, where you can find her research. Uh, she says, my research can be found by searching my name, Geneve Femi, that's um, F-E-H-M-I, on a publication database such as PubMed. It is also available through links on my supervisor's associate professor, Simon Rinaldi of Oxford University's webpage. He is the leading researcher in this field in the UK. So we'll be sure to put that in the summary as well. And I'm sure you guys have um, probably lots of articles that you've co-authored or authored on PubMed as well. That's another place Absolutely. that you can go. Okay, that's wonderful. Um, okay, again, final words from either one of you before we get into the close of our hour. Well, yeah. I think it was really yeah nice. So thank yeah. you for the the invitation. Um, and uh, you know, I always I'm really excited to talk to talk about my research. So yeah. you Absolutely. know, it's it's really nice and um, uh, yeah, nice to learn that there is uh, yeah interest in in what we do. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I want to say that um, yeah, so this this Benson Fellowship for for me personally, it was. Um, a really yeah important um, step um, in my career, um, and I think because without the fellowship, um, it would have been much more difficult for me to establish myself mm -hmm. as an independent researcher. Um, um, and I hope Alba that you will also experience that in in the future. Um, so I really yeah hope that the foundation is you know keeping this um yeah this this grand scheme mm -hmm. um because yeah. it can really make a difference and you know i think as a community it's important to um to get new scientists also uh yeah to to develop new scientists and give them a chance to you know develop their own research line and contribute uh, to the field so um yeah thank you to all patients who made this possible uh, and thank you for the foundation as well for supporting all our research. It's really important. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, I totally about? agree with you, Ruth, that uh, this is a very important work that you are doing from the foundation to support yeah. all our research. And also to, in my case, it was also a big opportunity, this uh, Benson Fellowship to continue my career in this field. And I agree with Ruth that this is a very small field, so we need to have more scientists investigating in all these uh, rare diseases. So yeah. thank you very much. It's amazing. Well, thank you both so much for joining us today. And thank you so much for being so patient-centric and so inspiring and so passionate about what you do. Um, we could not do what we do. We would not have a Benson Fellow without scientists and curious scientists like yourself. So thank you so very much. Um, I'd like to say thank you also to our sponsors today, our Gen X, CSL Bearing, and Griffles. Um, and also I'll give a plug for a couple of upcoming virtual programs for the foundation. On July 16th, we have a men's coffee chat. Um, and July 23rd, we have an MMN coffee chat that's multifocal motor neuropathy coffee chat. Um, there's lots of other programs. As Ruth had mentioned, we've got our 2025 Denver Symposium, which hopefully Ruth and Elba will be joining us. So you can hopefully meet them someday in person um, and lots of other conferences and support meetings that you can find on our website. So thank you so much for everyone for joining today. And we look forward to seeing you for our next webinar. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Bye-bye.